Yes, yes, yes. It's, it's a very modular talk, so I can arrange it depending on the time available. All right, so first of all, let me thank you, uh, uh, the audience, for being here and the directors for giving me the opportunity to visit a country that I wanted to visit since I am told like this. So for me, it's, uh, it's fantastic to be in Brazil uh, eventually. <coughs> So today I, I decided to use the one hour time I've been given to explain somehow my recent uh, research directions, research program, uh, in which of course I'm learning much more than what I am uh, producing. You know, I'm in the process of learning, but I would like to share with you some uh, things that I hope you will find uh, interesting. Okay, so the theory of statistical comparison and some applications in quantum informations and foundations. So first of all, I would like to introduce you what is the theory of statistical comparison, because this is not something uh, that everybody knows, but I think it provides a very good framework to study uh, many of the problems that are uh, now hot topics in quantum information theory. So let me start from the origin of statistical comparison theory uh, that was formulated in mathematical statistics in the 50s. Mm. <coughs> so the idea is that uh, you are dealing with problems that are called statistical decision problems where the statistician wants to get some information about some unknown parameter in nature. In this case, the picture is, could be, for example, some uh, bacteria that you don't know what it is and you want to cure the bacteria by using some antibiotics, right? So first, you want to, to develop an experiment that will provide you some distribution over some samples that you can observe. So theta is for you inaccessible, but you can somehow, you know, have a sneak peek about what's going on in nature by performing an experiment. Okay, so an experiment is like spying on nature, and the experiment will provide you some partial information about the unknown parameter theta, and depending on the samples distribution that you're going to observe, uh, you have to decide an action to take is you. So mathematically speaking, uh, statistical decision problems are given by giving a parameter space. So in this talk, every, uh, all these spaces will just be a uh, finite set. So everything is discrete and finite. On which you perform an experiment. The experiment is formally given as a conditional probability distribution. So essentially a family of distributions over the sample sex labeled by the unknown parameter theta. And then there is the decision stage which is the active part of the thing where uh, the statistician can actually look at the sample and conclude something that it can be good, this U. This is also given by conditional probability distribution. And then at the end of the day, the problem, the decision problem is defined by putting a payoff function that depends on the true but unknown value of this parameter theta and the action U that was chosen by the statistician. Mm, this is a real number that is positive, of course, can be interpreted as a good decision. If it is negative, it means that it was a bad decision and the statistician needs to pay something for the mistake. So again, you know, we need some notation here because, uh, you know, uh, I know it's boring, but it, it simplifies my life later on, so please bear with me. So a statistical experiment is a, or sometimes called statistical model, depending on the literature that you're reading, is a triple that is given by the parameter space, the sample space, and this conditional probability distribution. Whereas a statistical decision problem, sometimes called statistical game, because actually um, these were the first instance of games that were treated in game theory, is again a triple uh, where you have a parameter space, the action space u, and the payoff function l, which is a real vector now. Okay? So there is going to be some sort of duality between models and games. Okay? You will use games and some sort of linear functional on experiments. So given an experiment and a decision problem, you can try to understand how much you would be willing to pay in order to be able to perform such an experiment, right? Uh, more uh, in particular, we are going to consider the experiment as something that is given to us. So in a sense, it's the resource, mm, it's fixed. 
uh, whereas instead the statistician is free to optimize a decision. Mm? So we will, we will imagine that the statistician is a rational being that is trying to extract, to extract as much information as possible about theta uh, that is hidden in these um, sample distributions. And then the way to uh, describe how much an experiment is worth for you with respect to a particular decision problem is just to compute the expected payoff that you will be able to get in, in the limit of many repetitions of the same problem, right? So this is just an average payoff. You see you start from a uniform a priori distribution over the sample space, then you multiply this by the conditional distribution that propagates, you see it gives you now a joint distribution over sample and parameter, and then you propagate this through the decision process, and at the end of the thing you put the payoff and you average over everything. And you maximize, <coughs> sorry, you maximize over the decision D. Mm. So this is how much you would be willing to pay an experiment in a situation that is completely fair. In this way you can also now compare experiments. So the whole thing about statistical comparison theory is that we are comparing structures. So in particular here we are going to compare experiments and of course you can compare experiments if, if there are experiments about the same natural phenomena. So if these two W and W prime are experiments on the same parameter space theta, you can of course say which one of the two is better for a particular decision problem. Okay, so you just have to compare the expected payoffs and if this inequality holds, you can say of course that W would be preferable with respect to W prime for this particular decision problem. But people wanted to go a little bit further and to introduce a comparison that is uh, going of course to be now uh, only a partial order, actually pre-order. And uh, in statistical, mathematical statistics, they, infru they introduced what is called the information pre-order, which is defined as follows. So you say that one experiment is better than another, and you use this symbol. Uh, if the expected payoff you get from this is larger than the expected payoff you get from that, for all decision problems. So you see that typically when you pick two experiments, they will not be ordered, okay? neither of one will be better than another, but if it happens then that, one of, that uh, one of the two is better than the other for all statistical decision problems, then you use that symbol and you say that there, there are no situations in which you should prefer W prime with respect to W. Hmm? So formulated in this way, the information per order is very operational because it is based on the statistical decision problems that are tasks, are games, actually. There is nothing more operational than a game. But this is not really concrete, right? Because this is an order that involves all possible decision problems. So how can we visualize this better? And a, like, um, one of the foundational, uh, fundamental results in this theory was proved by Blackwell between 1948 and 1953, of course, you know, the things can get uh, mathematically, as mathematically complicated as you like, you can consider continuous parameter space with measures on them, blah, 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 and so on. But um, the meaning is that the information pre-order that was defined with respect to the statistical decision games is equivalent to a simulability condition. So, it's equivalent to say that there exists a, condi a third conditional probability phi that, you know, garbles up the first experiment's W until you get W prime. So it means that the, pre the uh, information pre-order is equivalent to say that the second experiment is equivalent to the first one plus some noise. Mm. Um, a very important precursor of uh, the theory of statistical comparison is the partial order of majorization that you might have heard about. Actually, uh, the theory of statistical comparison was introduced as a way to generalize to the multivariate case, the, the majorization order. So just let me briefly recall you what the majorization order was. So here, you don't have experiments, you're not comparing models, statistical models, but you're just comparing two 
probability distributions, P and Q, of the same size. Okay? So you imagine that the sample space also is the same from 1 to n. And then given these two probability distributions, P and Q, you construct the truncated sum. So first you order the entries in non-increasing order, and then you construct the truncated sum for P, and you do the same for Q, and then you plot them in this way. So here on the x-axis you just have equally spaced intervals, and on the y-axis you, you plot the truncated sums, and you will obtain some splines, some, um, you know, like uh, broken lines uh, for each probability distribution. And the majorization order is something about these lines that are called Lorentz curves. And you say that P majorizes Q whenever the uh, broken line corresponding to P is always above the broken line corresponding to Q. So for example here we see that the red Lorentz curve actually majorizes both the green and the blue, but the green and the blue are not ordered, okay? because they cross. So it's obvious that this is a, a partial order. Typically you cannot compare it to probability distribution according to the majorization order. And uh, another thing that is, is easy to see is that the minimal element here is the uniform distribution. So the uniform distribution would just correspond to the diagonal that, con that uh, links 0, 0 with 1, 1. Okay? So it's the minimal point. So there is a unique minimal point. And in these curves were introduced by this economist, German economist Max Lorenz, um, to measure the non-uniformity of wealth distribution in a country. So somehow it tells you something about your probability distribution with respect to the uniform one, how non-uniform that is. And the reason why this majorization order was famous and actually it became applied in many areas of statistics, applied statistics as well, is of this little but very beautiful result by Hardy, Little, Rule, and Polia that show that majorization is equivalent to the existence of a bistochastic matrix that transforms P and Q. So a bistochastic matrix is a matrix that transforms normalized probability distributions into normalized probability distributions, but keeping the uniform distribution as a fixed element. So the uniform distribution is mapped into itself. So how the Blackwell theorem relates with majorization? You can apply the Blackwell theorem to very special models that are just made of two probability distributions and you obtain a relative, uh, the, the concept of relative majorization or relative Lorentz curves that can be constructed in this way. So now you can compare not just two probability distributions but two pairs of probability distributions P1, P2 versus Q1, Q2 and they can also be of different dimensions. So you see you are kind of enlarging the things and now you have to relabel the entries not in decreasing order but you want that the non-increasing order is for these ratios. Okay? You remember before essentially what I'm going to tell you is that uh, the majorization is a special case of this when the second ones are the uniform distributions, right? But if the, sec the P2 and Q2 are not the uniform distributions, then you have to consider these ratios. And then you construct, according to this labeling, you construct again the truncated sums, and you have four of them. You have one for P1, one for P2, and then one for Q1 and another for Q2. So now you have four truncated sums, and you can construct what we call the relative Lorentz curves in this way. So before you remember, in the x-axis, we just had equally uh, separated points. Why? Because P2, in that case, was a uniform distribution. Okay? But in general, you don't have equally spaced intervals on the x, but you get these points, but you can construct broken lines. And the relative, uh, relative majorization preorder is exactly the same as before. So you want that one relative Lorentz curve is never below another. In that case you can say that one pair majorizes another pair. And here comes uh, sorry. And here comes Blackwell theorem that is specialized to this uh, particular case of pairs of distributions. So for experiments with only two probability distributions, tells you that the pair P1, P2 
relative, relative okay, majorizes the pair Q1, Q2, if and only if the PIs can be simultaneously mapped onto the QIs by means of just one uh, stochastic matrix. Okay? So you see that measurization is just recovered when P1 is equal to Q2 is equal to the uniform probability, because then it means that M is uh, stochastic. Mm? But in general, you have this thing. And I can tell you, for example, that you can see as a special case of a special case of Buckwell theorem, uh, all the thermal majorization thing, right? In the thermal majorization business, you just put P1 to be some Gibbs distribution, P2 is a Gibbs distribution for another Hamiltonian or another temperature, and you have the transformability of P1 to Q1 uh, by keeping fixed some thermodynamical requirements, okay? So there are a lot of things that have been rediscovered in the in decades, okay? Uh, before in the 70s and then again in the 90s and again in the, in the 2010-ish sort of thing. But these can all be seen as uh, very special cases of this Blackwell ordering, which is really a multivariate generalization of majorization preordering. So I found this an extremely you know, powerful uh, framework to explore, and I've been trying to see how far we can actually apply these ideas to various topics in quantum information theory. So first of all, how can we extend these ideas to the quantum case? Of course, when you start from a classical concept and you want to derive the quantum generalization, there is not just one way to do that. Okay? So there are infinite ways to make something non commutative into a non-commutative version. But I would say that it is very safe and healthy to follow uh, Holevo, okay? that actually already gave us a way to consider decision problems with quantum systems in a very famous paper published in 1973, Statistical Decision Theory for Quantum Systems. So the parallel that you should think about, according to Holevo, or so to say like the first level of quantizations of this problem, would go as follows. So Decision problems are the same. Decision problems remain classical, in a sense, because you still have a parameter space theta, you still have an action space u, and you have a payoff function l. Experiments are different. Experiments before were conditional probability distributions, that of course you can always see as a family of distributions on x labeled by theta. So what is the quantum generalization of a distribution? Of course, it's a density matrix. So now you have a family of density matrices rho theta, mm? labeled by the uh, unknown parameter. And now the sample space is replaced by a Hilbert space H. Decisions before were just conditional probability distributions, now are POVMs. So it means that in order to get the joint distribution action parameter, before you had to take a decision, now you perform a measurement, basically. Right? You can interpret the trace as a measurement. Mm? But then once you have the joint action parameter distribution, then you can compute, of course, the expected payoff, and here you go. The maximization over decision is just replaced with the maximization over POVM. But the structure is really similar. Actually, you can embed one into the other, and indeed, for example, it is possible now to compare quantum experiments with classical experiments. That would essentially amount to a comparison between a non-commutative experiment, where these rho theta do not commute, with something instead that commute. Right? This is like the first thing that you might think to do with these things. No? And indeed, you get a theorem that is exactly, I mean, it follows perfectly the analog of the classical Blackwell theorem. Consider two quantum experiments. This is just to give you like a flavor of the kind of things that you can prove. Consider two quantum experiments. One is rho theta, another is sigma theta. And I tell you, moreover, that the sigmas commute. Then you can say that the first experiment E is always better than E prime with respect to all statistical decision problems, if and only if there exists a CPTP map that transforms simultaneously all the rows into the corresponding sigma, right? 
but you can do more. And indeed, you know, <laughs> you just have the freedom of choice here, uh, which kind of problem you want to extend. For example, you can have a fully quantum information preorder where you are comparing non-commutative, I mean, two fully non-commutative quantum experiments, right? So both the rows and the sigma do not commute. You can consider quantum relative majorization. So you might think of specializing to just pairs of quantum states. Row one, row two versus sigma one, sigma two. This is in particular relevant for quantum thermodynamics. You can use this thing to compare quantum measurement. So now your objects are not going to be any more families of states, but families of positive semi-definite operators. And what you get, you would get a preorder that can be interpreted as the compatibility preorder. Okay. So you would say that uh, essentially what you, what you have, this transformability uh, thing, would amount to being compatible. Okay. You, can, you can consider kind of resource theory of incompatibility in these terms can compare quantum channels, okay? And here you have a lot of choice. When you treat channels, you know, you can map them in very different ways. You can imagine to transform them with a map in the input, and you get input ability preorder. You can imagine that you are going to transform them with a map acting on their output, and you get the output degradability preorder. Or you can have actually correlated input uh, correlated maps from both input and outputs, and this is just coding, okay? What people call comms, you know? Quantum comms is essentially a coding-decoding sort of a strategy with, with correlated maps. And you have a lot of applications for these ideas. This is a very general framework, you know? So being very general is not deep. You know, general things cannot be deep, but you can specialize the framework and you can obtain some deep results there. Um, I'm not saying this does not mean that what I'm going to tell you is going to be deep, but I'm telling you that it might become deep uh, with more effort. Okay? So today in particular, since this, this uh, meeting is about quantum information and quantum foundations, I will focus on applications in these two fields. So let me start uh, with information theory. So what is the viewpoint of communication theory in these things? So it's interesting to notice that the first result of Blackwell in this line, 1948, appears the same year of Shannon's paper, 1948, okay, the mathematical theory of communication. Um, and it is interesting to know that before Shannon somehow, communication theory was done by statisticians. It was a, a field that was much closer to that of uh, mathematical statistics. But somehow, since the appearance of Shannon's paper, the two fields diverged. Even though both, both you know, communities use very often the same tools. But uh, it is interesting to see that many results were discovered sim in similar ways in both, in both uh, communities. But there was not so much communication between the two. The main difference is that for a statistician, this input for us, you, you know, you can consider this as the input alphabet of your channel. This is a condition probability distribution. Right? So this is a channel, a noisy channel. And theta can be considered as the input alphabet, x as the output alphabet of your channel. Okay? But for a statistician, theta is inaccessible. So nature does not do coding. Nature does not want to communicate with us. It's us that want to try to understand what nature tells us. But she is, doesn't bother telling us things, okay? So she doesn't do coding. Whereas for communication theory, coding, codes are crucial. So you actually imagine that this thing is actually the input of a channel, and there is a sender that is encoding messages on theta, because the sender wants to tell you something, okay? So there is a message M that is encoded on theta, then X goes to the receiver, and the receiver decodes with respect to some action. Okay? So this is probably the reason why, even though the mathematical tools are similar, the two communities didn't speak so much with each other because the goals somehow are different. One is studying communication, another is studying estimation, which are related but also different. 
So if you, if you come more from the communication viewpoint rather than the estimation viewpoint, then it's natural for you to consider another set of games that you can introduce called decoding problems, where also here I give you as a resource, instead of uh, an experiment, I give you now a channel with input alphabet X, output alphabet Y, and uh, the transition matrix. Now a decoding problem is defined by an encoding. So there is Alice that uses some encoding. Okay, You know the encoding, so you know this conditional probability uh, X given the message M. And now the payoff function is the optimum guessing probability. So the payoff is that Bob wants to guess the message that Alice sent him with the highest probability. Hmm. So here you have the same thing. Essentially, what we are doing here, we are considering a, an estimation problem where the payoff function is just a delta, delta function. So Bob wins if the decoded message is the same that Alice sent, and Bob loses, so he gets just zero in other situations. Okay, so we have this structure. Uh, the message M is encoded on X, which is transmitted to Y, which is then decoded into some M hat. And then the payoff function is just a delta between M and M hat. So you have this kind of, you know, it's a restricted, it's a specialized subset of uh, statistical decision problems, which are good for this communication scenario. So now you can compare classical noisy channels with these guessing games. So you imagine you have two channels and you use the same encoding on the two of them. Hmm? And now you can ask which one is better for your uh, problem, for your to guess, which one gives you more information about the message. And you can prove the equivalence between these two. So you can say that there exists a, a, an, another channel, a degrading channel, a post-processing channel that transforms channel W into channel W prime. And this is equivalent to say that for all codes, the information about the message M contained into the output of the first channel Y is more than the information about M contained into Z for all encoding. These are equivalent, and it is interesting to see that, especially in the second uh, scenario, this reformulation is extremely reminiscent of an, a preorder that was introduced by Kerner and Martin back in the 70s, 1979, I think, that they called um, noisiness preorder. But they were not using this H mean, which is related, by the way, with this guessing probability. Okay? They were not using the guessing probability, but the Shannon conditional entropy. But apart from that, you see that these are ex essentially the same definitions. Right? <coughs> so what would be then like the, the analog in the quantum scenario? In quantum scenario, you can consider uh, quantum codes. So what is a quantum code? Of course, like a quantum channel comes with a lot of capacities, right? But let's say that we stick with the truly quantum capacity of a quantum channel there you can imagine that the goal is to transmit entanglement through the channel. And so it's natural to consider that the code there is a bipartite mixed state. Omega R A R is just a reference that can be kept by Alice. And the system A is transmitted to Bob through the channel N. And then when it reaches Bob, Bob is free to apply a decoding CPG map D. And the goal is to maximize the singlet fraction. So given a quantum channel from A to B, a quantum decoding problem is defined by a bipartite state, and the payoff function is the optimum singlet fraction. This is exactly how you start the definition of quantum capacity. You start with the definition of singlet fraction as in the order, the, the, the quantity that gives you the error right in your protocol. And here you do the same. You optimize over this decoding maps D. There is the code, and then you take the overlap with the maximally entangled state. <coughs> and you can prove the analog for quantum channels by using quantum codes. So I give you now two channels, N and N prime, and you can say that these two are equivalent, actually these three. Okay. So there exists a CPTP map that 
post-process n into n prime. So this is the degradability preorder. This is equivalent to say that for all quantum code, the singlet fraction you get from n is larger than the singlet fraction you get from n prime. And you can, of course, re rewrite the singlet fraction thing again using some h mean. So you see again how close parallel you preserve. I mean, the, uh, the analogy between the results you can prove are striking, even though you're dealing with completely different objects and the proof technique is quite different, though the main ideas are pretty the same. Okay. This result is interesting because by adding some symmetry constraints, so if you require that your post-processing map C is a map that preserves symmetry with respect to, to the group of rotations generated by the Hamiltonian, for example, then you can directly apply this to have uh, a full set of conditions for the existence of a thermal process, quantum thermal process. We applied this recently with uh, <coughs> Gilad Gur, David Jennings, Imam Marvian, and Rune Yao Duan to, to, to construct a complete set of monotones for quantum thermodynamics with the symmetry. With so resource theories of thermality and symmetry at the same time. <coughs> There is another interesting application um, that is about applying these ideas to uh, the dynamics of open quantum systems. Because, so the, to make a long story short, essentially this degradability preorder of channels when applied to evolution of an open quantum system is equivalent to the divisibility property, which is related with Markovianity. So what is a discrete time stochastic process, you can just imagine that you're following your system in time from T0 to, to Tn, let's say, and you label states of your system at each time instant Ti by this Xi. Hmm? So if you imagine that at time T0 you can control your system, you can say that an open uh, evolution is fully, a stochastic process is fully described by this conditional probability. Given the input, I know the joint distribution at all other subsequent points in time. The problem is that when you want to make these things quantum, the, the, you, can, you don't have a joint distribution at different times. This is a well-known problem. And so we have to content ourselves with, uh, with less structure, in a sense. And when you're dealing with an open quantum system, then uh, people usually describe this by a dynamical mapping that is now a family of channels that tell you how the system goes from T0 to each subsequent time Ti, but considered one by one. So I know I'm given, for example, the CPTP map that propagates my system from T0 to T1. I'm given the one as a different channel that propagates from T0 to T2 and so on. But of course I don't have a joint state at different times. This is something that quantum theory does not allow you to do. And now the problem of divisibility is whether or not this dynamical mapping can be divided into CPTP maps that propagate your system at each subsequent time step. Okay? So it means that this dynamical mapping, that is this family of arcs, that join the initial point with all subsequent points can be divided or not, can be broken or not into smaller evolutions from each Ti into the subsequent Ti plus one. This is the divisibility problem, which is closely related with Markovianity, but I, 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 wouldn't, I don't want to dig into the reason why this concept is, is uh, slightly weaker than Markovianity, but somehow it incorporates many of the desiderata you want for Markovianity. In particular, this is, to me, the only meaningful way to describe a memoryless process, which is the core of Markovianity. Okay. So for me, I mean, divisibility is, is the crucial property of a Markovian process. Um, so what, 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 what can you do then? How you can apply the quantum coding problems here? Well, you can imagine that you track, okay, so this is your system Q. You don't actually follow just your system, but you actually prepare a bipartite stain with some reference, and you just track 
the amount of entanglement, how entanglement, how the single fraction, actually, to be more specific, how the single fraction evolves in time. If the, single fr in this, if the singlet fraction never increases, so if it is monotonically decreasing, this is like uh, I try to depict the monotonically decrease, the monotonic decrease by the thickness of these lines. So if these lines never get thicker in time for any initial condition you put here, then you can conclude that the process is divisible and vice versa. Now you can tell me, okay, thank you very much, but how can I find a condition for all states, right? So the problem is, how can we construct a witness given an open, s an open quantum system dynamics? So this is something I would like to come on uh, later. At this time, let me just tell you that if you want to decide the divisibility of a process, then you should use SDP, semi-definite programming, because it, it, it can be proved that divisibility problem is SDP. This formulation, so the formulation that the theory of statistical comparison gives you, is more about, it tel tells you more something about the resources at stake there. So here, the resource that is consumed or, or the resource that should never go up in time is entanglement. And that's enough you that you can consider like as quantum information. But if you really want to decide the divisibility, then in this case, you'd better use SDP because that's efficient, okay? So SDP and the theory of statistical compa comparison somehow are dual to each other, right? But I will have the opportunity to come back on this point later on. So I would like to stop here about, you know, the use of these things in quantum information theory, so to the study of quantum channels. But I would like to move instead to some applications in quantum foundations and in particular, the problem of probing quantum correlations in space and time. So the starting point is to notice that <coughs> structures like Bell tests can be understood in statistical decision problems as distributed decision problems. Where now there are two statisticians, Ellis and Bob, that are separated spatially, so they cannot communicate. But somehow the, the idea is the same, is that they have they are given only partial information because Alice is only given X and Bob is only given Y, but they have to come up with some sort of coordinated or synchronized decision strategy that allows them to, to win a game. That is, by, by the way, it's given in a very similar form with statistical decision games. You just have now two parameter spaces, two action spaces, that are the questions and the answers, and then the payoff that essentially defines your Bell inequality. And then you imagine that Alice and Bob can actually synchronize their decisions by using some shared source of correlations. And this source can be classical or quantum. If that is classical, then just by assuming some very natural requirements like no signaling and so on, you can come up with such a characterization for input-output distributions that you can get. So Bob's decision can only depend, of course, on the question he received and this hidden variable lambda. The same for Alice. Her decision can only depend on her question and the hidden variable lambda, and then you have some distribution of their hidden variable lambda. Whereas if Alice and Bob are allowed to share a quantum source, then this must be modeled as a bipartite state. Okay? So this are the ways in which you can write the input-output correlations. And then the payoff that you expect to get from this source star, which can be classical or quantum, will be a maximization of this average payoff, where here, of course, if the source is classical, you can maximize over all local hidden variables. If the source is quantum, you can you know, optimize over uh, all these quantum probability distributions. In particular, you can optimize on the, on the, strateg on the strategies, on the two POVMs. Okay? This somehow should tell you why a few years ago, for me, it was kind of natural to come up with the idea of semi-quantum non-local games. Because for me, it was the actual, you know, the straightforward generalization of those ideas that I was studying before about this uh, quantum statistical decision problem to uh, Bell tests that for me were just distributed decision problems. So now, 
it was kind of natural for me to say, okay, what happens if Alice and Bob receives not partial classical information, but partial quantum information? So what happens if they receive two quantum states, tau x and omega y? Okay, so what happens if the referee that is asking questions is not just asking classical questions to them, but it's first encoding these classical questions on states and then distribute the states to Alice and Bob. You can just write down the correlations that you expect to obtain from a classical source or for a from a quantum source. Okay, So this is kind of uh, natural. And you can see that these games actually constitute a much larger class of games. Like, for example, you, you, you I'm sure that you can see that if tau x and omega y are perfectly discriminable states, then of course you are falling back onto the usual class of uh, Bell tests, right? Because Alice and Bob, actually they don't even know, they don't even need to know x and y, it will be their measuring apparatus that will get information about x and y. Okay? But more generally here the referee can choose to encode questions on non-orthogonal states. Okay? So it is indeed a larger set of states of games, sorry. But again, as before, you can construct the average payoff function. Fine. Nothing controversial about that. But now, yes? Yes, so they know this. They know what are the, the, question, the questions x, the questions y, and what are the st state questions tau x, and what are the state questions omega y. Of course, they don't know which one they received, but they, they can optimize, yes. That's part of the strategy. And then it was interesting to see, okay, let's try to introduce now a, a partial order with respect to these games, what we get. We get very nice, to, to me at least, uh, kind of compact, let's say a very compact characterization of this order in terms of the possibility of transforming one state rho into the state sigma by means of these local operations with shared randomness. So essentially, if you are happy to define non-locality with a semi-quantum non-local games, then you can end up with a sentence like the state rho is more non-local than state sigma if and only if there exist local operations with shared randomness that transform one into the other. Okay. In particular, from this result, you have two corollaries that are uh, like uh, immediate, and actually people got in more interested into the corollaries than the structural theorem before. But of course, one you can say that because this no semi-quantum no-locality ordering is equivalent to the transformability with local operation and shared randomness, all separable states are equivalent to each other, just because any separable state can be obtained with an LOSR. So it means that all separable states should give you the same payoff. But more than that, it tells you that for any entangled state, there must exist one semi-quantum non-local game that gives you a payoff strictly larger than what you get from separable states, just because if not, you would be able to obtain rho, which is entangled, from some separable state and local operation and shared randomness which cannot be done because you cannot create entanglement out of nothing with these operations. So you have, the, I mean, the, uh, the punchline was essentially this corollary that tells you that all entangled states are non-local. Fine print with respect to semi-quantum non-local games. Okay. <coughs> but then other properties were actually discovered about the semi-quantum non-local games by work by Danilo C, Cyril, Branciard, and people in Geneva, and almost at the same time by um, uh, Eric Cavalcanti, Michael Hall, and Howard Wiseman in, in, uh, in Queensland. <coughs> so they interpreted the semi-quantum non-local games as measurement device independent entanglement witness. So it's essentially a witness where you can essentially, you know, you trade trust for preparation, and usually preparation is easier to trust than the measurement, which instead can be completely left uh, free. So you, you can mistrust completely the measurement apparatus at Alice and Bob, and they can measure for you an entanglement in that way. 
So it was a, a very interesting um, interpretation of these ideas. So, for example, now you can have entanglement witnesses that withstand losses in the detectors, which is very good because typically detectors we have are lossy, and we know that with entanglement witnesses, if you don't use this trick of encoding questions in quantum states can be completely spoiled by losses. But even more interesting is that if you use quantum questions, then these games can withstand an arbitrary amount of classical communication exchange between Alice and Bob. And this is very interesting because Bell's tests instead we know that are completely spoiled. If you just allow one-way communication between Alice and Bob or, to Bo or from Bob to Alice, any non-local game is spoiled, right? Because as soon as Alice is able to communicate to Bob her question, then they can simulate any probability distribution. Whereas here, if the questions are encoded on quantum states, then Alice and Bob can chat on a, on, a, on a phone as much as they like. They can exchange as many messages as they want about the states, but they will not be able to cheat. They will not be able to simulate any entanglement. And this is very interesting for us because it allows us you know, to now to take these non-local games among space-like separated parties, so non-communicated parties, and turn them around into time-like games. Which is something similar to what Leggett and Garg have done, you know, in 1985. So they, they wanted to turn Bell inequalities from space-like to time-like, and by considering correlations between questions and answers at subsequent times, at, at for there they have three times, they wanted to derive conditions for which you can be sure that the evolving system is quantum. The problem there, however, uh, is that you cannot rule out communication from past to future, of course. You cannot. If you have two parties that are separated in space, of course, by timing, the questions and the answers, you can always enforce or be sure you know, that the events in which Alice and Bob compute their answers are space-like separated. So there, there cannot be communication between the two, if you are careful enough. But if you turn this thing into a time-like configuration, then there is no way that you can solve this loophole. You can close this loophole, the communication loophole, that in this, in the legged gark situation, becomes the clumsiness loophole. So clumsiness, clumsiness loophole, okay, uh, I, I don't think I have the time to get into that, but it is something that tells you that legged guard inequality in their original formulation does do not allow you to conclude anything at all. Okay, you cannot close this loophole, which is uh, essentially the time-like analog of communication loophole. But now here we have some games that can withstand communication. So they don't suffer communication loophole for classical communication. And so, I mean, they beg to be turned into a time-like scenario. So what we get? So the Alice-Bob dichotomy now becomes Alice now, Alice n later. Okay, so you have one player that receives two quantum questions, the first quantum question at some time t0, and the second quantum question a little bit later, say t1. And then the player needs to reply you some classical answers, A and B. Actually, A is not really needed, but just for the sake of symmetry, let's keep it here. And now you want to compare two situations. The first situation is when the player has unlimited classical memory. So if the player can store as much classical information as she wants during the game, what you get, you get something like this. So you see that the first question goes through a first measurement that depends on some classical variable lambda that can be whatever, like something that Alice, like a die that she rolls there. You get some part here. And then later on, when, but of course you see that nothing is left, okay? because nothing can be provided. There is no quantum memory here. So the only thing that she can do when she receives the first questions is to make it a classical number A. And then when she will receive the second quantum question, she will perform another measurement that now is, can depend both on lambda but also on A, because it was an outcome she got before. So she can remember it. And there is no way to force Alice to forget. So this is a measurement that can also depend on the first outcome, and it will give you the second outcome. And this is how you construct these input-output correlations. What happens instead? How can we model the situation in which Alice has something more? She also has some...
A, yes, yes, like A is something that depends on X and so carries information, whatever information you extracted about X. So what if Alice has, besides this, you know, a memory, okay, yeah, she, she remembers very well, she, she, she's a woman, so she's much more memoryful than, than, than me, for example, right? I'm always the person that forgets things. My wife, she remembers everything. So she has a fantastic classical memory. What happens is she also has some quantum memory to use, some quantum channel N. Okay, so here we have to be a little bit more delicate in computing this probability that she gets, but essentially what she can do is decided. There are not so many things she can do. So first of all, she will feed the first quantum questions into a quantum instrument. The quantum instrument is a measurement that does not give you only a classical answer A, but also gives you some quantum output that depends on everything. So the first instrument produces the classical answer A that is stored, output and stored in principle, but also some quantum output. This quantum output is the thing that is going to be fed through the memory N, the quantum memory. The quantum memory N will store this for a certain time until the second question comes, the second quantum questions. And now these two quantum, que these two quantum parts, the quantum output of the memory and the new quantum question, will be both fed into the final measurement, which is now is a P of M because the game stops here, so you don't need any quantum output now, which is going to output the second answer B. <coughs> So if you want to put everything into a formula, you get this guy, which is a bit long, but not difficult to see what is going on. So here, first of all, you have this random variable lambda, which is not really necessary. Again, I kept it here only for the sake of symmetry before. Then you have the first quantum question. This goes through the instrument that produces the first output A. And then this is piped through the memory N. And then at some point in time, the second question will come, quantum question, so it's in a tensor product because you have both available. And the final measurement will be a joint measurement on, the bo on both these quantum bits that Alice has at her disposal at that point. And here you have a PQ, so it's a quantum input-output correlation. So here again are the two formulas for you to compare, just because I wanted to tell you that the cases in which this N can be, actually it gives you something that can be described as classical correlations, are the situations in which your channel N is entanglement breaking. So an entanglement breaking channel is a quantum channel, is a fully fledged quantum channel because it accepts quantum states as inputs and it gives you quantum states as outputs. They can be non-commutative. The point is that what is propagated through space-time by an entanglement breaking channel is just classical information. It's information about this index i. <coughs> so these are fake quantum channels, channels that have quantum input or quantum output, but they are not really doing anything quantum to the information they propagate. <coughs> and indeed, if you plug an entanglement breaking channel into this formula, you are going to get something that can be written as a classical probability distribution, as classical correlation. And now you have a structural theorem for quantum memories. So now the question is, what happens? How you can compactly describe the situation in which two channels, N and N prime, now please notice, by the way, that both input and outputs can be different. So A, the first channel goes from A to B, the second channel N prime goes from A prime to B prime. So what is the equivalent condition to being better than another for all the signaling non-local games? You have this structural theorem. So it tells you that this pre-ordering here with respect to games holds if and only if you can obtain the channel N prime by means of a classically correlated coding as here. So you have some encoding that gives you some quantum output and some classical memory A which is stored and then used for the decoding part. Okay, so uh, one could call this like a, uh, like a quantum com 
by using you know, the nomenclature of quantum comms, a quantum com with a classical memory, or a, class or a, quantum, a quantum channel with classical memory, or just a coding structure that only uses classical correlations between uh, uh, input and output. Okay, so you see that things somehow tend to get together. Okay, so um, these semi-quantum games can actually be used to probe quantum correlations with respect to any um, like ca causal structure between Alice and Bob. Okay, if they are space-like separated, you will be probing entanglement. If they are time-like separated, so if Bob is actually in the light in the future light cone of Alice, you are going to uh, to to probe not only entanglement but also uh, you know the existence of a channel that is really able to propagate uh, quantum information from Alice to Bob. And so, in a sense, this can be seen as a resource theory where free channels are measured and prepared channels. <coughs> in particular, you know, applying the same ideas we had before for semi-quantum non-local games. Um, uh, you see that any non-entanglement breaking channel can be witnessed. So you can imagine a, a game that does this. So there is a perfect analogy between separable states and entanglement breaking channels. Somehow you can say that these things, these signaling semi-quantum games, somehow can be the thing that cure, finally give a cure to this clump, very nasty clumsiness loophole. Mm. Um, okay, so conclusions. <coughs> So what is the theory of statistical comparison? The main message is that you are comparing two statistical structures that can be channels, experiments, whatever, something that has some statistics in it, some uh, probabilistic phenomenon, X and Y, and you want to give conditions for the existence of a transformation of X into Y in terms of fi fin f finitely or infinitely many monotones, so like functions, typically linear or, s or sublinear functions, of x and y. And you see that here somehow x and y are decoupled. So in a sense, you can say that these monotones shed light on the resources at stake in the operational framework at hand, right? Because you can say that each monotone measures some resource that is in x. This is very different from what SDP does. So SDP have functions that depend on both x and y. And depending whether these functions are above or below a threshold, then you can say that there exists a transformation or not. Okay? So these are efficiently computable. If this formulation exists, this is efficiently computable, whereas the monotons may not be efficiently computable. But this does not give you information about the resources at stake. So <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> there, there is no need to. <laughs> um, so it's really a sort of dual formulation. Okay, the theory of statistical comparison tells you something, and SDP tells you something else, and they're both necessary. And the very nice thing is to link the two. The problem is that not always you have an SDP. So sometimes you know you have to say, okay, uh, this is as far as I can get, but I have to stop, right? Because there is nothing more I can do. And also my talk stops here, and I thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>